Welcome back to CFO Weekly, where we're talking with financial leaders about how to build efficiency in their teams, create time for strategy, and ultimately get results. With your host, Megan Weiss. Let's jump right in. Today, my guest is Misha Mikhailov. Misha is Chief Financial Officer and Board Director of Strive, and he has been integral in structuring the company's strategy into new verticals, raising capital, and negotiating strategic partnerships. Misha has more than a decade of experience in financial management, business strategy, and best practices from the hedge fund management space. Prior to joining Strive, he was CFO and COO at New York-based Union Square Park Capital Management. Misha, thank you so much for joining me on today's episode. Hey, Megan. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me on the show. Really excited to be here. Yeah, you're an experienced CFO and COO with a demonstrated history of working in hedge funds as well as startups. And today we'll be learning about your journey as well as some of the insights and lessons you've learned along the way. And I'm really excited to hear your story. So let's get started. Absolutely. First, and as always, let's start with you and your career journey and how it is that you got to where you are today. Uh, well, uh, in my current role, um, I spearhead capital raising, strategic partnerships, sales, and uh, fp and But my journey here was actually an interesting one. Uh, in my sophomore year of college, uh, I got my first internship at a boutique hedge fund called Tree Capital, which was really exciting. Uh, and I started helping out with really anything they needed. But as time went on, I, I showed my hunger, showed my excitement and reliability, and eventually took on more responsibility. They ended up offering me a full-time position uh, in an operations and finance role for which uh, I pushed myself to graduate a year earlier uh, to start that position. Uh, The company grew very, very quickly. And over the following five years, I expanded into managing a team of people across operations, finance, marketing, uh, and other roles. Eventually, uh, I ended up moving over to a new fund called Union Square Park as CFO and COO, where the portfolio manager and I launched the fund together. In that role, Uh, I set up the infrastructure, systems and processes all around trading, accounting, audits, reconciliations, compliance, marketing, and and a lot of other areas. Uh, At that fund, we we invested in all sorts of asset classes. And in my fifth year there, we came across this company called Strive. Uh, We had this investor group made up of VCs, family offices, and other investors. And we would periodically invest in deals together. Uh, But this specific deal was an extremely exciting uh, one for all of us. But really particularly for me. Uh, on, a, on a personal level, I was always obsessed with anything health, wellness, or, or fitness related. Uh, and in college, I was on the swim team. Uh, we, we'd practice for hours a day. And after college in my career, uh, whenever I wasn't working on analyzing a, a deal or you know whatever the, the, the circumstances led to, uh, in many cases, you'd find me listening to a podcast on health or reading a book on it. So Strive really resonated on on many levels for me, and it was the most unique solution I ever saw in serving a global problem. So after investing personally among the investor group, I was helping out the CEO and founder, much like I did with other early stage investments. And eventually, uh, I couldn't resist. I I decided to follow my passion, uh, leave the fund as a partner, and instead join Strive full-time as a CFO. So I went from investor to an operator, and it's truly been an amazing journey. Yeah, it sounds like the perfect fit for you. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about Strive and what it is that they do and their mission? A- absolutely. So uh, I'll start with a, a personal anecdote. Uh, I have a bunch of friends and, and folks in my community that play basketball or run or cycle, and a large portion of them have all sorts of risk-based heart trackers. Uh, and almost all of them at some point stop opening their apps uh, because the data doesn't really tell them anything aside from sleeping more or drinking less alcohol will make them perform better, which is nothing new, really. And so what's clear is that most people want actionable insights that give you recommendations on your next workout or like a video game, tell you which parts of your body to improve and how in order to get you to your fitness goals. I can bore you with statistics regarding how we collect 30 to 50 times the data points of a risk-based device or the correlation between heart rate and muscle fatigue. But ultimately... Strive is a behavior change company. We create intelligent clothing with sensors that monitor your neuromuscular health, your movement and heart rate to understand your body and make it better. Using patented algorithms and AI, we empower people to understand how to achieve their fitness goals by quantifying true physiological strain and making people unbreakable. We work with some of the top athletes and performers uh, in the world, including Jonathan Taylor, Mark Andrews, Spencer Dinwiddie, Drew Holiday, Cheyenne Parker, 
and, and military special forces. But whether whether you're a professional athlete or whether you're a military service member or a manufacturing line worker, we we help you stay healthy. We we prevent injuries. We achieve your goals. Uh, and at some point soon, we'll we'll actually launch consumer as well. Uh, for me personally, one of the craziest statistics that most people don't know about is that uh, one of the highest correlations to human longevity has nothing to do with sleep, nothing to do with diet, nutrition, supplementation, or, or, or even genetics. The fact is that one of the highest correlations to human longevity by a large order of magnitude actually has to do with uh, your muscle strength. And there are specific muscles that obviously have the highest correlations, including glutes, forearms, uh, and others. But beyond that, one in two people in America will suffer a major musculoskeletal issue within their lifetime. And so at Strive, that's what we focus on. We focus on neuromuscular health through clothing that people are already wearing and loving. Yeah, that's amazing. I look forward to the day when it is available to consumers. I work out at Orange Theory and... Um... Yeah, like you said, I, I just go every day and do what I'm told, but I don't really know what areas of my body need more work than others. That's um, yeah. truly advanced. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll add you to the to the wait list. <laughs> yes, please do. Um, so talk to us about your proudest achievements since joining Strive. You've been there uh, since 2019, is that correct? Yep, that's right. Uh, proudest achievements. Uh, I guess aside from my family and seeing my little girls grow up and develop, <laughs> um, in, in all seriousness, uh, it's it's really building an incredible team of very intelligent and hardworking people. Uh, we have an amazing culture, and it really is like a second family. I think uh, I think we've done an amazing job at being methodical in our hires and attracting the right people to the company. With with the team that we have, with their teamwork, we've made a a game changing product that I think is unlike any other. And because of that amazing product, we ended up announcing some really powerful partnerships like with Spartan Race and a few others. During COVID, uh, when the world was shutting down, all of our employees actually stayed with us for basically no pay because they believe in the mission and we have a very, very close-knit culture. Yeah, I guess when you have a product that you truly believe in and a story that resonates, like, you know, changes people's lives, that um, it's easy to enjoy what you do every day. A hundred percent. That's that's really it. Just focusing on that that vision and that product and making sure everyone sees it as well. And as you mentioned before, you spent the first part of your career focused on investments and hedge funds. So what inspired you, and maybe you touched on it a little with your love of sports, but what inspired you to leave that world for a software company, a sports software company like Strive? Uh this was uh this was an alignment of the stars. Um, I met Nicola, uh, the founder, uh, we hit it off immediately. This was back in early 2019. Uh, once I experienced the product he built and then his vision for where this could go, I was immediately hooked. There was nothing else like it. And I really knew that I, I wanted to be a part of it and there was no better person to, to partner with than Nicola. I, I actually, I don't want to diminish that last point. Having the right work partner is arguably as important as having the right business plan. So it was really, uh, it was passion and excitement. I've always been a super tech forward person. And when you combine all of my interests between tech, health, finance, and deal making and joining a team of amazing people, it, it really was just a no brainer for me. I love when the stars align like that. <laughs> and how has it been working for a startup? And what do you enjoy most about that kind of environment? Um, you know, for me, having having a role where you can have sort of a leadership presence and and really get boots on the ground to kind of affect change and change things. Right, the biggest the biggest difference um, I would say between between startup world and, and hedge fund world is that in the in the hedge fund world, uh, you know, it really was a massive change. At that point in my career, I went from giving management teams my input on how to run their business. Mm -hmm. to being in the trenches and actually solving the issues as an operator. There was this big element of affecting true change and, and driving results. After going through the ups and downs of running a business, uh, I developed an enormous amount of respect for entrepreneurs. Really being in that driver's seat is what 
taught me a lot about leadership, building teams, and really across so many disciplines. It also infected me with that entrepreneurial bug. So I don't think I'll ever shake that. (laughs) And when you think back to 2019 and your first days at Strive, how did you integrate yourself into the company as the CFO? That's that's a good question. Uh, The team actually actually made it really easy. Uh, They were very, very uh, quite welcoming. Uh, before I officially joined, I actually uh, spent a ton of time with uh, Nicola, the CEO, and you know met everyone on the team, spent time planning my role. Uh, I ended up making a 90-day execution plan along with the CEO, which we identified together the key areas of focus for the business. And I really just went straight for the jugular on, on all of them. Uh, over time, as I continued to build rapport with the team, trust came very easily. And as we began to grow and hit our milestones together, that, that expanded even more. Uh, I'll also say that buying gluten-free bagels and non-alcoholic beer for the team goes a long way too. <laughs> <laughs> and with the pace of growth at Strive, how do you make sure that you're hiring the best talent to fill each role, particularly as the roles are continuously evolving? That, that's a good question. Uh, we're, I'd say that we're very, very focused on, on those culture fits. We have a set of core values that we really adhere to, uh, and we make sure to identify those that fit into that. Because we have such a close-knit culture, uh, it becomes easy to see if there is that mutual fit and if we resonate on an individual basis and on a team basis. Uh, Skill, obviously, very, very important. But if the values don't resonate, it just doesn't work. Uh, And so to simplify it a bit, we want to make sure that even outside the workplace, we'd love to hang out with this person, basically. Yeah, that makes coming to work a lot easier when you really enjoy the people you work with. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, we we all get along really well. We're, we're we're like really close family, so it definitely helps a lot. And just this year, you received six million dollars Series A round funding at Strive. So tell me about the approach to first of all bringing in that money with new investors, and secondly, what initiatives you're focused on as far as growth. Sure. If you can. Um, <laughs> sure. Um, hang, hang on one. So basically. I would love to tell you that it was easy, but truly this is a a daily grind. When you're inventing something that hasn't been done before, uh, there are many naysayers, obviously. And as such, uh, as part of every raise, we want to be very strategic with the investors that come in. We wanted to ensure as part of all of our raises that not only could they provide the financial capital, but that they would also understand the future potential and value, support us in the best of times, support us in the worst of times, and really help us get to that next level. Uh, I, I'd say, I think everyone at the company agrees, we're, we're very blessed to have the investors that came in for that Series A, especially um, some of the athletes. You, you probably saw in ESPN and a few other places, we had some really amazing athletes come on board. With those specific athletes, our approach was really just to provide as much value as we possibly could to, with the product. Uh, they ended up just falling in love and jumping in with both feet and that ended up helping us a lot in all sorts of parts of the business, whether it was more sales or more funding. Um, on a very specific level, though, a lot of my founder friends that I exchange notes with, they always ask about the process of fundraising. Uh, I think one thing that's just worked for us really well is is networking as much as possible. I know that's I know that's really really cliche and common, but some of our biggest and best investors came from one percent probability events a random meeting at a conference or a trade show, or even offering product feedback to another company that ended up making an introduction out of gratitude. Um, I I have a lot of other hacks for capital raising. So I would just encourage anyone to reach out and ping me on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to help wherever I can. And you studied finance and investments in college. You're also a CFA, and that's a chartered financial analyst, correct? Right. Right. So how does that background, along with being a CFA, how do you feel that gives you an edge as a CFO? Uh, that, that's a good question. Um, I, think, I think there's really two elements of it. Number one is, um, given, the, given kind of the investment background, I think it allows me to, to, to talk to all sorts of stakeholders, whether they're investors, board members, uh, or, or internal folks, uh, internal teammates. I think having that background of you know what do investors look for you know uh, how, how do they how do they expect to see things what are some of the things that they're you know focused on in a particular market like right now in this specific macro uh, economic environment so I think that part has helped me a lot uh, being a charter financial analyst has also helped me you know understand sort of the nitty gritty of things um, not just from 
uh, an analysis point of view and financial planning point of view, but also from a from an operational point of view. So it, it's definitely made me a, a more well-rounded leader, uh, I think. Um, but obviously, I, I didn't I didn't always know that I wanted to get into this world. Um, I, actually, the the way that I came into the investing world, uh, l- like most kids in high school, I actually didn't really know what I wanted to do. But one day. I meet the guy who would eventually become my brother-in-law. Uh, he was working in finance at the time, and I was enamored of what he did for a living. Uh, I was enticed with what he was experiencing on a daily basis in the markets, learning about various businesses. And at that point, I decided to just go all in. I applied to Baru College, joined all sorts of investment extracurriculars, and eventually knew I wanted to become a, a CFA charter holder. Um, and, and the rest is really the rest is really history. But you know, the the move from the move from that into the into the startup world was was really interesting. I just wanted that sort of in the trenches feel, and uh, it's it's been amazing, really. Yeah, I'm sure that background works beautifully at a startup. Yeah, yeah. Um, the 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 aspect of you know financial modeling and and making decks and things like that obviously goes uh, goes to some lengths, but I think really it, it comes into play with the whole strategy of things. So yeah, definitely very helpful. And prior to joining Strive, you served as both COO and CFO for Union Square Park Capital. So talk to me about how the role of the CFO has evolved to allow this to happen, where a CFO can be both a CFO and a COO. Uh, that's that, something that's a, we would have never seen like two decades ago. Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, you know, it's, it's somewhat common um, in, in the hedge fund space. Um, particularly for hedge funds that are initially just uh, starting out, um, the the role is you know somewhat interesting because in in hedge fund world the COO does a lot of obviously financial uh, aspects of the business. Um, as as the as the hedge funds end up growing, they end up delineating and siloing those those uh, roles where the CFO becomes a lot more involved in just the pure financials of the business, the auditing, you know, the investor relations, and the COO handles things related to trades and you know reporting and portfolio attribution and things like that so um i ended up taking uh i ended up having both roles there um and it really allowed allowed us to build a, a holistic kind of smooth uh operational process uh, at at the fund and talk to us a little bit about the difference of being cfo for union square park capital versus strive what's the difference when you look at those different types of companies yeah, that that's a really good question. So the the two biggest differences are the roles of, I would say, the roles of leadership uh, with respect to to the stakeholders and how how headwinds are felt and navigated. the The role of CFO isn't just to deliver financials and tax returns, but it's to help the CEO achieve his or her vision while being the balancing force of realistic financial and operational limitations. So so at Union Square. Uh, which was an amazing place to work, by the way. The persona of teammates and stakeholders is somewhat similar. There's, uh, you know, sort of this singular frame that you lead from. Uh, whereas at Strive, we have hardware, firmware, software engineers. We have a sales and marketing team, manufacturing operations, customer support, and uh, board of directors, shareholders, vendors. You know, you have all these sort of stakeholders, um, and that's quite a lot of different personas. Uh, and so. My sense of EQ, understanding people, building rapport, expanded rapidly. Um, with respect to the headwinds, at the fund, the, the biggest headwinds came from the markets. And there was, in many cases, little that we could control when the entire market was falling apart. At Strive, like other startups, the headwinds, I guess they can feel sometimes like whack-a-mole, where you solve one problem and then another pops up in another area. Uh, and a lot of times they feel existential. So having a great team is really what helps with this because our, our teammates have a, a true sense of ownership uh, and their mindset is really solution oriented. And talk to us about building teams a bit. Um, what do you feel is the key to successfully leading and building teams as a CFO, particularly in today's talent market where good talent seems to be few and far between? Yeah, that's uh, that's a loaded question. Uh, I think. <laughs> I think uh, one of the biggest keys, uh, I think, to building a relationship is uh, being a leader, I should say, is 
is building those relationships with, with each individual person. Uh, each person is going to have different wants, different needs, different desires. And so as a leader, you have to develop each teammate to become the best version of themselves. Uh, in my view, leadership has nothing to do with title. Uh, I think the greatest leaders lead by first showing their team that they can execute, uh, whether in the past or on the current team, and then truly, truly developing relationships and helping elevate each person. Ultimately, you then end up leading them with a vision that people, that everyone can get behind. Um, in terms of your, your question on the evolution of the role, um, and especially in these times, I think I, I think the past few years specifically have shifted the definition of, of a CFO. When times are great and there's minimal volatility, leading a team is much easier. But the last two years have been very, very trying on businesses and more importantly, people. I talk to a lot of people in the space, whether they're investors or founders or you know any, anything in between. And I think the CFO role is now expected to be right there alongside the CEO leading the company and its teammates during those troubling times, uh, helping them make sense of things, helping them deal with some of the volatility with sort of a hands-on approach. Uh, I think we're lucky to have navigated these macro waters, but I also think it's very important to row alongside the team. You sound like you're a great leader. <laughs> That's <was> really <laughs> great insight. Thank you. Thank you. So what are the biggest challenges as you look out into 2023 that you and your team are facing? Uh, I guess going back to that macro, I think it's going to be just navigating the macro uncertainty. We're still very optimistic with our business, given the sectors that we provide value into. Uh, but we will have to maintain our prudence for sure. And what advice do you have for other CFOs or aspiring CFOs? Uh, I'll preface I'll preface with the fact that my position evolved and morphed uh, more into this broader leadership role because of my desire to contribute more globally beyond perhaps what a traditional CFO role might might have. Um, I, I know many people who believe the role is very numerical and accounting focused, which obviously isn't the case. Uh, and as the role continues to evolve and the world navigates more of these turbulent economic waters, even beyond that, I think over time, what defines a great CFO will also shift. The, the strategic elements are most likely going to become a lot more emphasized. And I think there's going to be a need from CFOs to have that broader leadership role. Uh, I think the CFO will be even more relied upon for strategic guidance or, or, or leadership of the team, helping set the culture, and really just being that right-hand person for the CEO. So I think for, for really, it's, it's a greater focus on, on higher-level strategy. Focus on EQ, focus on team building. I think all of that's going to be paramount for CFOs and for aspiring CFOs in the coming years. Yeah, that's great advice. And so last question, and this is not the question on this list, but as a CFO, what are you doing to prepare you, yourself, and your team and organization for the future when things seem to be changing constantly how do you prepare and how do you how do you budget how do you like how do you prepare your organization for the future at, during these tumultuous times uh that, that's a great question um there's there's a lot of different aspects to it from from a leadership perspective i, I think communication and transparency with the team you know meeting with them regularly making sure that they're constantly aware of what that vision is right because if if the economy has volatility, if the management team is feeling volatility, you're sure to bet that the, your team as a whole is feeling it, even if they don't tell you. So I think from a leadership perspective, there's that angle of just letting people know exactly what's going on in the company. You know, Maybe not necessarily second by second, but just very frequent communication about where do we see the company going? What are some of the things we're going through and how can each person help? Being very you know clear and uh, direct with how how all of us can can pitch in. Um, in terms of sort of the 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 strategy aspect, it's really you know whenever whenever things happen in a, in a startup, there's there's a a multitude of sort of optimistic things that happen, things you're looking forward to, things you're working on. I think having a range of potential outcomes, uh, you know whether they're bull case, you know bear case, base case, you kind of have a, a range of outcomes that can happen, and you try to prepare for the worst. Um, and, and obviously 
hope, hope for the best. But I think preparing for the worst situation and just maintaining prudence, uh, like for Stripe, for example, uh, our finances since the inception of the company have always been very prudent. Um, you know, we, we didn't overspend on things. We, you know, we were very careful about um, projecting out additional in, uh, expenses, et cetera. Uh, I, I think really that's that's the biggest thing. Uh, you know, I, I can't sit here and say that me or anybody else knows exactly what's going to happen. Uh, at this point, even a month out or two months out, let alone six months to a 12 months out. Um, but I think I think just having that constant strategy view of being conservative, you know, having the help from all stakeholders, whether they're teammates or investors, um, and just really having um, your pulse on things is, is really helpful. Yeah, that's some great advice. And that word transparent, I hear that from a lot of like a lot of the great leaders that I've spoken to. And I, I, I mean, it's right. People want to know the news, whether it's good or bad. They want to know what's going on. Um, I mean, it's their livelihoods after all. Exactly. Exactly. I think at the end of the day, if you if you take care of your teammates, uh, your customers, and everyone else will be taken care of as well. Yeah. Misha, thank you so much for being my guest today. Uh, Megan, thank you so much uh, for inviting me on the show. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, I really enjoyed speaking with you and hearing about your experiences and all of the resulting insights. And I wish you and Strive all the best. I can't wait to see what, what you both do in the coming years. And to all of our listeners, please tune in next week. And until then, take care. If you're ready to boost efficiency and streamline your accounting processes at significant cost savings, it's time to talk with Personif. Their people-powered solutions have transformed the delivery of back office tasks and general accounting functions for decades, partnering with clients to provide everything from accounts payable to payroll services. See what Personif can do for you by visiting personif.com. You've been listening to CFO Weekly presented by Personif. Please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts to hear all of our episodes. Want to learn more? Check out personif.com. Thanks for listening.